So we are in, uh, I believe this is week number four of the way of Jesus. We're spending a whole bunch of time in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, kind of uh, taking apart this Sermon on the Mount that we're, uh, many of us are familiar with. If you haven't joined Restore Church on the Version Bible app, we'd encourage you to do that. You'll find us, uh, you'll find Restore as a church that's listed there, and uh, you can join in on the Bible reading that we're all doing together on that app. So today, we are in Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30, and uh, this is the second of the six antithesis, or more commonly known as the, you have heard it said, that Jesus, uh, that Jesus uh, speaks about. Before I get too far into this, uh, I want to ask you an uncomfortable question. And if you choose not to respond, it's okay. I just want you to know that up front. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I'm not, uh, I'm not one who has uh, started a church so that we can make sure everybody is uh, feeling really comfortable all the time. Uh, we uh, started Restore Church because we felt like we needed a place to tackle hard subjects and that we wouldn't shy away from difficult conversations. So, just to give clarity to this, if you have been affected by adultery in some shape or form, and if you're comfortable, just give a quick raise of your hand. Yeah, a few brave ones. And for the rest of us, it's okay. We all are on a journey, and sometimes it takes us time and healing to get to a place where we can look this kind of thing in the eye. That's where we're going this morning. In John chapter 8... If you're familiar with the Gospels, John chapter 8, John writes this, <clears throat> of this incident where Jesus was teaching in the temple, and uh, he was in the temple courts, and um, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman to him. And uh, I imagine they brought her in and kind of threw her down in front of him and said, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. How do you say we should take care of this? Now, they were trying to trap him once again. They were trying to get him to uh, either subscribe to the laws that they were wanting to enforce, or uh, they were going to uh, catch him uh, siding with uh, the Roman government on this matter. And uh, he simply uh, squats down and begins to write in the sand. Now, we've always wondered, what was he writing? We sure wish we knew what those words were. But it doesn't give us that information. Scriptures don't tell us that. It simply says he stooped and he's being to write. And they kept pressing him. And he said, okay, you guys, you want to you wanna move into this matter so, so eagerly? How about um, if you don't have sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And Scripture says that one by one, the scribes and Pharisees left that space until Jesus and the woman were by themselves. And Jesus asked the woman, where are your accusers? Are they not here anymore? And she says, no, they've all gone. And he looks at her and says, I don't condemn you either. Now go and don't sin anymore. It's a beautiful picture of a person who had a divided heart. Somehow, she had a divided heart. She had multiple uh, allegiances, and she got caught in the middle of it. And Jesus looks at her and says, I don't condemn you either. Now, go and live a different life. So when we tackle hard subjects like this, I think it's important just to lay the groundwork and to say, Guilt and shame are not yours to carry. If there is 
adultery in your life, if you are in the middle of it, if you are tempted by it right now, or anything else that would give you a divided heart, that you have multiple allegiances, then you have to know that if you feel anything this morning, that I've been praying and I'm praying for this morning that there would be conviction here to live differently. But if you feel guilt and shame, then I believe the enemy is whispering in your ear and calling for your defeat instead of for your thriving. So we have these age-old questions when it comes to this sort of thing. And frankly, anywhere else, we want to push on the boundaries. We, we ask, where are the lines? Uh, what is permissible? Uh, what can I get by with? Are there any rules? Sometimes it seems like we say, oh, we're trying to say, well, let's set the bar as low as possible. Like, what's the least that I can do and still be good? What's the minimum requirement to follow Jesus? What a crazy question for us to ask. But we do. We say like, what's the least I can do? And we adults say that. We adults, like, even if we don't say it with our words, we say it with our thoughts, we say it with our actions. What's the least I can do and still get God's approval? Uh, when we do this, you guys, we, we simply misunderstand the heart of God toward us. God is for our thriving. He always brings his best, and he calls us to bring our best for, in everything that we do. This is his heart. And so as we step into this scripture, be mindful of what are you feeling as we work our way through Matthew 5. 27 to 30. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. There it is. You have heard it said that you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust, and I might say a man with lust, has already committed adultery with him or her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Hell being like a moral trash pile, if you will. And verse 30, and if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Okay, let me push the pause button for a second, and let's talk about hell for just a minute. Now, the, the audience in Jesus' day would have been very clear about what he meant by this word hell. He would have actually probably used the word Gehenna. Gehenna. It's a Greek form of the Hebrew words, two words, Ge and Hinnom. So that means Valley of Hinnom. For those people in that day, they knew that place to be the local dump. It's the place where all the trash got taken. It's the place where human uh, uh, dung got taken. All kinds of things. It's the place where the fire of Gehenna never, there was always a fire burning. The fire of Gehenna never went out and the worms never died. We've heard, if you know scripture, you've heard that phrase. It was located in the valley along the south side of the city of Jerusalem, which was used in Old Testament times for human sacrifices to the pagan god Molech and came to be viewed as a place of divine punishment. This was the place that Jesus was referring to, and everybody knew they didn't want to get thrown into that place. So just get perspective here. When Jesus says, you have heard it said, he is pointing to, again, one of the top 10, top 10 commandments, right? So number one of the commandments is no other gods, only me. Uh, number two is no carved gods of any shape, form, or size. Uh, I know I'm not saying them the way you know them, but this is easier for us to think about. No misusing the name of God. Number four, observe the Sabbath. 
Number five, honor your parents. Number six, we talked about last week, don't kill each other. No murder. Number seven, no adultery. There we go. Number eight, no stealing. Number nine, no lies about your neighbor. And number 10, no lusting after your neighbor's stuff or the people around you and, and your neighbor's people, including your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband. That's what he's pointing to. In, in number seven, no adultery. Don't commit adultery. He's actually, um, we know that society moves away from number seven for some reason. We'll get to that. But we move, society in general moves away from number seven. And Jesus calls it out. And he brings clarity to the relationship between lust and adultery and deepens the seventh commandment by saying, hey, the tenth is don't be covetous. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet what your neighbor has. If you're going to covet what your neighbor has, you're going to end up living in adultery. So let's, let's give the legal definition uh, for adultery. Adultery simply means a married person having sexual intercourse with someone who is not their husband or wife. Some of you are going, whew, I'm not married. That means I'm off the hook. Not really. Not really. Because there are many, uh, the legal definition is not really how Jesus defines it. The legal definition is one, is one thing, but Jesus goes beyond this and he says that unfaithfulness begins with what a person is thinking or feeling inside. Follow me? What Jesus is saying is that a divided heart begins with what we think and feel inside. Verse 28, but I say, he's, Jesus, these are Jesus' words again, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus says that sin, which is doing wrong, isn't just an action, but it's also the wrong thoughts and desires that we have. Here's why. Wrong thoughts and desires lead to wrong actions. Remember, we are a people who are producing fruit in our lives. And one of the, 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 the attributes of that fruit is self-control. Self-control means that we not only control our physical bodies, but we control the most difficult thing to control for most of us is what happens here in our minds, in our, between our ears. That is the most difficult place for most of us to control unfaithfulness. It starts in the heart and mind. You know that God has given us great imaginations. Like we can pick, close our eyes and we can picture, some of us can picture a preferred future. We can actually think about, about things that are not yet created, but we can envision what they look like. We can, we can take a pen to paper. We can draw it out. We can write it out. We can imagine the beauty that God has, uh, has, has placed in us, in our thinking, we can imagine all kinds of beautiful things. But we can also land in a fantasy land that if we continue there, and it is a fantasy land that we are not in control of our minds, that it takes us down a road where we begin to fantasize about that other person or that other possibility, that becomes a real landmine and it'll blow up on us. Again, it is, where do we let our minds go? Where do we let our minds go? The title this morning is No Harm Done. No Harm Done. Let's, let's pull that apart a little bit. Boundaries are really beautiful things. Boundaries are beautiful. They allow for a healthy, normal appreciation for beauty without objectification. That's why we often get into trouble when we don't control our minds, when we don't, when we don't have clear thinking, when we veer, uh, we veer into adulterous thinking. There's 
there's what is called, uh, like there's, there's this thing of normal attraction, right? Normal appreciation versus lust. Lust is degrading, it objectifies, and it is consumed with self. We must never confuse lust and love. Let me remind us that love looks out for the good of the other. Lust, on the other hand, is about our own selfish motives with no regard for the good of the other. When Jesus uses, in uh, verse 29 and 30, when Jesus uses the example of, if your eye causes you to sin, take it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Look, he's not, he, he's not meaning for us to take that sort of thing literally. If you remove your eye or if you cut your hand off, will your brain begin to think differently? Does that have anything to do with the thoughts in your head, the motives, the dark motives in our hearts? Of course not. Of course not. What Jesus is calling us to is to deal drastically with the sin in our lives. He's saying, don't flirt with it. Don't give it any space at all. Hate it, dig it up, crush it. That's what God's calling us to when he calls, when Jesus says, gouge your eye out or cut your hand off. This is serious business that he's calling us to. Uh, we, we often want to call uh, sin less than what it is. We want to say like it's an illness or it's an um, aberration or like it's abnormal. That's what we want to say about sin. Uh, sometimes we'd rather treat it than repent from it. But if we continue to live into this, if we continue to live into sin and we keep minimizing it, it'll pull us in, it'll twist, it up, twist us up, it'll tangle us, it'll tangle our thoughts, it'll, it'll tangle up our actions until we are sin's pathetic victims. Paul writes in Philippians 1.21, the apostle Paul writes uh, to the church in Philippi, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If Paul would have subscribed to this way of thinking of just treating it rather than repenting of it, he might have said this in reverse. He might have said, for me to live is sin and chaos and hell and to die is loss. Those might have been his words. But instead, when he's writing to the church in Colossae, uh, Colossians 3, chapter five, uh, verse 5, he says, so put to death. He's not into sin. He's not into holding it up and saying, as a, calling it a virtue. Instead, he's saying, put it to death. The sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. This is a fun list, huh? It's a grim list. Like, you look at this list, and it's just, filled with all the things that we would never want to have ascribed to us. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, which means uncontrolled desires, evil desires, greed, idolatry. You know, uh, greed looks like, um, greed looks like uh, a, a throw, it all, throw all caution to the wind, sort of a ruthless desire. It's, uh, it's like an intense grasping of anything and everything I can get my hands of on. It's, it's that kind of action. It, greed completely disregards the good of the other person. Uh, when we are uh, greedy, we are subscribing to our, uh, subscribing or submitting to our lower nature. And that lower nature is an idle factory of self-interest, elevating our own wants, our own needs and desires above and in place of others, and especially above God. This is a nasty list that none of us want to be aligned with. But sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we are living into these descriptions, these characteristics. 
And sometimes it's because you and I have, sub, have, have believed the lies that we've been told. We've believed the lies like, I heard Christian couples, women, saying things like, well, I don't, you know, as long as he doesn't touch, he can look. Don't touch, but you can look. This is a lie that taints your mind. This is a, a step into a lack of self-control. It is a step into unhealthy thought patterns that are only going to serve to critique and condemn you as time goes on. Sometimes we've subscribed or we've heard to the, the lie uh, that choices and decisions that we make are no big deal, like no one else is, is affected by this. I mean, it's, it's two grown adults, right? And so it really doesn't matter. We're not impacting anyone else. And frankly, you guys, those decisions and choices that we make will affect those that follow us, those that are in relationship with us, kids, grandchildren, spouses, coworkers, all the people that surround us are impacted by the decisions and choices that we make. So what do we do? What's the solution? How do we move from this place to the place where God's calling us to? Well, I believe, first of all, that we need to remember the words of the Hebrew writer in chapter four, verse, four, 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 verse 15, when he says, for we do not have a high priest. Jesus is our high priest. We don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So he reminds us that there is one who has gone before us, who has lived very differently, who has given us a pattern to live after. His name is Jesus. He understands our weakness. He understands the things that are going on inside of us. And he's giving us a way out. So renewing our mind, renewing our mind. I will say this week after week after week because I believe that this is the place it starts. The renewing of our minds, the transformation of our hearts will bring about the restoration that we, the people, are looking for. It does not come unless we have a change of heart, change of desire, a renewing of our minds. I want to give this warning. Unchecked thoughts turn into stupid decisions that turn into drastic consequences. Some of you sitting here this morning are either living into this or you have experienced it. And for those of you that have not experienced this, this word is for you. Because I guarantee you that anyone sitting here this morning, anyone online this morning, that Anyone who has experienced this would tell you, run the other way. Don't go down this road. There's nothing but grief and sorrow ahead of you if you go down this road. Now, that is not to say that God doesn't take lemons and make lemonade out of it. He does. God does beautiful things when we Repent, he restores. Our transgressions, our sin is as thrown as far away from us as the east is from the west, scripture says. He will remember it no more. Now the people around you will remember. They will remember. And they may bring it up and they may throw it in your face and they may never forget but you have to know what voice you're going to listen to. Is it the voice of shame and guilt from other people? Or is it the voice that says, I don't remember your sin anymore. 
You have repented. Now go and sin no more. Which voice will you listen to? Let's go back to John 8. We aren't told what happened after Jesus released this woman from condemnation, but we can imagine. We have an imagination. We can put our imagination to good use. And, And I would imagine that this woman changed her ways, that she no longer lived in that place of a divided heart. She had experienced mercy and grace and forgiveness And I can also imagine that her life after that wasn't easy. The very thing I just said, people will gossip, people will speak. They bring up the hurt because of our past. And so despite the forgiveness we receive, sometimes we listen to those voices of self-condemnation. Sometimes we allow others to remind us of our past. Sometimes the shaming and self-loathing we do may seem like it comes from us, but we have to remember that is mostly from our enemy, Satan, who continually whispers in our ear everything we've done wrong, telling us how guilty we are, how worthy we are of condemnation, how beyond forgiveness that we are, beyond the reach of mercy, beyond the reach of grace. But let me remind us that in the shadow of the cross this morning, Such accusations lose their power. They have no power over you. None at all. Shame and guilt is not for you to carry. Like the woman brought before Jesus, you'll find that your accusers have left empty-handed with no evidence against you. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, as we confess our sins and turn them over to Jesus, they no longer define who we are as a new person in him. The key component is here, here is, is repenting, to say, I have done this, and I repent, I am sorry. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus Reminding you that the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Jesus promises forgiveness when we confess what we've done wrong. And he not only forgives, but that sin is removed and it is forgotten. These are powerful promises. Both the woman in adultery and for us today. It's not just for back then. It is for us today. Our past mistakes, they fall away as Jesus whispers in our ears these beautiful words, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Do you stand with me? The writer of Proverbs in chapter four writes these helpful words. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Verse 24, avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Simple but profound instruction. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Do you see the choices? Do you see the decisions in this proverb? Fix your eyes on the goal that's ahead of you. Some of you this morning, I know this is a hard word, and um, I hope that the, the thing that you're hearing me say this morning is that there is another way than the way that our heart leads us down so often. Align your heart with Jesus and the pitfalls of life. 
can be avoided. And you can thrive. Let me pray for us. Father, all over this room, for all those online this morning, I know that this topic of adultery, this topic of hearts being divided in multiple ways is a difficult one and one that has impacted so many people. It's sort of a normal part of our human condition, it seems. We, as a people, choose, though, to reconcile what is out of alignment with you. We want to be a people who thrive and grow and who leave the next generation with not a lot of scars, but instead a lot of good fruit to follow. We want people to be healed and restored. And so we will act accordingly. Father, I pray for a deep, deep commitment on this body of believers that we would not walk the way of the enemy, but that we would walk the way of Jesus. Help us to be those people who are so different that others would look at us and say, I want what they've got. As we started this service this morning, we heard the words of David after he was accused by the prophet Nathan. And we heard these words, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to us the joy of our salvation, Father. And even in this moment, I would speak the words of the psalmist in 139, where he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's anything wicked in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, let those words ring true in our lives that we would be so open before you that a clean heart, clean mind would be the thing that we're driving our life after. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.